Hello everybody, I'm Martin Kleppmann from the University of Cambridge and I'm very happy to talk today at the ACM conference on distributed and event-based systems on thinking in events. Now, uh, first of all, thank you to the people who support my work financially and who make this possible. What I want to talk about today is a kind of taxonomy of the big wide world of event-based systems. The word event means many, many different things in different branches of computing, depending on who you ask. And I've spent um, the last 10 years or so working on a variety of different uh, event-based systems, both in industry and in research. And through that, I have built up uh, at least some kind of subjective uh, categorization and taxonomy of at least how I think about differentiations between different types of event-based systems. So I think this sort of analysis will necessarily be subjective to an extent um, because it's simply such a big area. Um, but I hope that the categorization that I will talk about today will at least be helpful to you as well in the way that you think about event-based systems. So when I think about events, first question I want to ask really is, well, what exactly do we mean with the different aspects of what an event could be? So to me, an event could be, first of all, a notification of the fact that something happened. And so a, a piece of code, some function gets called as a result of something occurring. That could be an event. Also, an event could be a persistent record of the fact that something happened, where that record of something that happened is written to disk so we can re retrieve it again later. Or it could be both. It could be a notification and a record at the same time. So let me break those down a bit more to see what we actually mean with that. So as a notification, essentially I'm thinking here like a callback function or something like that, which gets called in order to handle something that happened. Classic example for this would be in a user interface where you have a button that the user can click and when the user clicks the button, then some function in the application code is called to handle whatever that button click should do. Likewise, with any other type of user input, of just moving the mouse cursor or typing, a, pressing a button on the keyboard, whatever it is. Um, that's a classic example of uh, events in user interfaces. We also get events in different contexts. For example, we get event loops in I.O., in an I.O. context, where um, say you want to be able to read and write from several files or read and write several uh, network sockets. And so you can have a, a non-blocking interface to these, um, to these IO operations, which allows you to wait on a bunch of file descriptors at the same time. And then when, whenever any of those file descriptors has some data available to read or it has managed to write the data in some buffer, then you uh, get an event saying, okay, what, what has happened in that event? And then once you've handled that, you go back around the loop again and you keep repeating this in, in, in a loop. So that's an event loop. Event loops also occur in simulation software, for example, where the events would be simulated uh, occurrences of something rather than real life occurrences, but it's very much a similar kind of thing. And uh, it generalizes to more different, uh, different types of programming models as well. So reactive programming or functional reactive programming or data flow programming, not exactly the same things, but what they have in common is that they are ways of writing code that handles changing data in some way or another. And so one example of this would be a spreadsheet. A spreadsheet, you can have a formula in one cell that references the value in another cell. And if the value in one of those input cells changes, then the result of the formula automatically gets recalculated and you see the updated value in, in the formula cell as well. And so this is just one example where the change of the data in one cell is an event, that, is, that data change is an occurrence, which then gets propagated through the system through potentially multiple formulas in order to update all of the data that depends on, on that particular input. Now, all of these uses of events as notifications uh, are ephemeral. So that is an event that only exists in memory as a transient uh, thing of calling a piece of program code, essentially. But it's not usually, the event itself is not something that would be written to disk normally because there's no, it has no lasting value. It's just something that is um, part of the execution of a program. We could take a very different perspective of events, which is to say, actually, we don't care about whether they're notifications. We want events to be recorded in, on disk as a permanent record. One example of this would be in a time series database, which you might use, for example, to record the readings from a sensor. So the sensor every minute sends you a reading of the current temperature. 
you don't need to call any application code every single minute when that sensor gets a new value. All you want to do is to store those values in a database so that afterwards you can draw a nice chart of how temperature changed over time. Um, and of course, time series databases are used for many other things besides sen sensor readings as well. In that case, a, a reading from the sensor would be an event. Um, a similar pattern occurs in data warehousing. And so there, this is often used for business analytics. Say, for example, if you want to analyze the sales of a company, uh, a standard way of representing that in a database is what's called a star schema or a snowflake schema, where there's one table in the middle that holds all of the things that happened, all of the facts or, in, or events, which are usually time stamped each row with, for example, how many uh, pieces of which product were sold to which customer at what price. And so uh, each, each record or each row in this fact table is really an event, uh, a record, record of the fact that uh, something happened, like a particular product was sold. And so in these cases, when we're talking about persistent records, it's not really a notification mechanism, but it's rather uh, just in a way of ensuring that data is recorded in a way that is later available for querying and analysis. <clears throat> but we could combine these properties. So we could take the persistent aspect of databases and we could take the notification aspect of event loops and callbacks and fuse those together into something that I'm just going to, I'm just going to give that a label of stream processing uh, for lack of a better term. And in the rest of the talk, I'm going to concentrate on this aspect of events that are both persistent and notifications and uh, drill down further what in the ways we can look at that. So I'm going to call this stream processing and um, a couple of examples of systems that use this approach. So for example, some message brokers um, that are used for uh, communication between different services in an in an organization. Uh, you can have one service that enqueues a message, which is then delivered to some other message. And this broker, which handles the messaging, may or may not write the message to disk as part of its handling of that message. And so writing it to disk means that even if the broker crashes, you don't lose the messages, which is useful. Although typically this is not long-term storage of messages. So typically the messages get deleted after they have been processed. Um, the actor model and their various other different programming models for distributed systems, which eventually, which uh, involves sending a message from one process or one thread or one machine, one node to another. And you can think of the sending and delivering of messages as, as events as well, uh, which may or may not be persistent depending on the particular framework you're using. Um, moving more over to the databases world. So in databases, uh, you all know you can make a query and inspect the date, state of the database at one point in time. Some databases also support continuous queries or stream queries, where you don't just query a one-time point-in-time snapshot of the database, but you actually keep the query open. And so then later, after you've issued the query, maybe some additional data comes in that would change the result of the query. And in that case, then the result of the query gets updated, a bit like in the spreadsheet uh, example that we talked about earlier. Um, and you get you get back a feed of updated results of this query. Um, so this is very useful. A, a similar concept um, appears also in some databases under the name of materialized view maintenance. So uh, materialized view is essentially a cache of the result of some query. So for example, uh, as I've got on the slide here, the query might be something like you want to aggregate the number of or the, the value of sales um, for each calendar month by the store in which they occurred, uh, which is just a standard group by query and then summing up the revenue for each uh, item that was sold. And so you might want to keep a cache of this, which is just a, a number uh, for each month and for each store. And this means now whenever a new uh, sale comes in, so a new sale gets added to the underlying table, which is sales in this case, uh, you need to update the materialized view, which is the cache of these query results. And like in stream queries, this is again a kind of notification mechanism where the change in some underlying data or some underlying set of facts results in a change in this derived piece of data, this derived data set um, that is a function of the underlying data. <clears throat> and so all of these are, I would say, examples um, of event-based systems that have both the persistent aspect and the notification aspect, but there are an important distinction to make 
with those types of systems, and that is about windowing. This may seem like a bit of an obscure implementation detail to focus on, but I think actually it's a very important distinguishing detail, and a lot of the literature doesn't really make this distinction very explicit, and so that's why I want to call it out very explicitly as, as a question that should be asked for the purposes of a taxonomy like this. Um, so windowing means we are going to group together events that occur within some time period of each other. And this is very often used if you want to do some kind of analytics uh, over stream-based data or complex event processing, which means combining several events to spot patterns and to, uh, to then generate some derived events that are the result of combining several input events. And so a simple example of windowing would be that we simply want to group together all of the events that occurred on a certain day or a certain week or a certain month, whatever unit of time you like. And uh, perhaps we're just going to you know, calculate the sum of some value per day or something like that. Um, some kind of way we're going to take together all of the events that occur within some time period and treat them as one unit. And then each time period is separate from the other time periods. Um, that's one way of windowing. There are other ways as well. So for example, the windows don't have to be mutually exclusive. You could have overlapping windows. Uh, so something like a five day moving average over some data, for example, would be an example of a sliding window. Um, or another example would be, say you want to correlate two streams of events uh, where events will occur within some period of time within each other. So let's say you have a car park uh, and you have a a sensor uh, for cars entering the car park and a sensor for cars leaving the car park and you want to work out how long has each car been in the car park for and so in order to do this you have to join the entering event with the exiting event and you can join them by maybe having a number plate reader um, that identifies each car as it goes in and comes out and so here i've represented each uh, car each different car with a different color and the join between these events uh, by joining up the, the two events with a line. And you can see here that uh, generally a, you can expect that a car will exit the car park after it has entered the car park. So the, the period of time in which it stays in the car park is usually a non-negative amount of time. Although you could imagine things with clock skew, for example, where you might actually observe a negative time after all. Um, but the question is now for windowing purposes, well, is there some upper bound that you can assume? So what is the maximum period of time from the car entering to the car exiting the car park? The maximum period of time that you're going to assume, and maybe it's something like 24 hours. And if a car does spend more than 24 hours in the car park, maybe it's going to get a fine or something like that um, because you don't allow long-term parking in this car park. So uh, in this case, if you can assume some kind of upper bound, on the time period between the entry and the exit event, then you've got a windowed join here um, because you are assuming a, a maximum time bound on this thing. On an unwindowed join, you are assuming there's no upper bound on the distance between the events that you want to connect to each other. And in in a non-windowed join, um, that means you know you don't you can't just work on fixed time intervals. You have to potentially look arbitrarily far back in time in some other stream in order to do that join. So let me give you an example of a system where you cannot do windowing and where you do have to look back arbitrarily far in time. And that is, let's say we wanted to implement Twitter or some similar kind of social media app. And uh, if you've used Twitter, you know the way it works is that if you log in as a user, you see a bunch of tweets that were written by the people you follow. And you can follow or unfollow people as you desire. Um, and if you implement this in a kind of relational schema or kind of entity relationship diagram style, you could say that uh, the currently logged in user has a many to many relationship to the users they're following. So they follow many users and the user may be followed by many people. And then each tweet is sent by one particular user. So each tweet has a unique author. And so if we now want to find all of the tweets that were written by uh, users who the current logged in user is following, that means we have to start with the currently logged in user. We find uh, using the follows table, we we find all of the the entries in the follows table where the follower ID is the currently logged in user, um, which then gives us the followee ID is the user who is being followed. 
then we find all of the tweets by the user being followed, where the sender ID of the tweet equals the user being followed, and then we print out those tweets uh, after having sorted them by the timestamp at which they were sent. Um, so this is a, a simple way how you could implement Twitter. And in fact, I think it is how Twitter was implemented in the very early days, but it turned out to be very expensive because people uh, often will read their list of tweets. So people log in and refresh their page and so on very often, uh, much more often than people actually send new tweets. And so they ended up having to cache the result of this query or alternatively make a materialized view of what they call the home timeline. And so the home timeline is what you see when you log in, which is all the recent tweets by people you are following. So let's think a bit about how we would construct this cache or this materialized view of the home timeline. So we can think of Twitter as an event-based system where there are maybe two or three types of events. Um, firstly, a, a user can send a tweet, uh, that's one type of event, and the user can follow another user, that's another type of event, and maybe a user can unfollow a different user, that's a third type of event, okay? And so now the, uh, the input to our system are just these events of sending tweets and following and unfollowing, and we want to compute the timeline, the home timeline, as a function of those input events. And you can think of this as being essentially a join between the sending tweet event and the following uh, event. So if user A follows user B, and then sometime later in, in time, user B sends a tweet, then we want to add that tweet by user B to the timeline of user A because user A is following user B. But the time when user A followed user B might be a long time ago, it might be 10 years ago, that the user signed up for Twitter, they followed a uh, user B, and then 10 years later, that user B sends a tweet. And so what this shows us here is there's no upper bound we can assume on the time between the following event and the sending tweet event. Uh, so there's no way we can use windowed joins here. This has to be a non-windowed join in order to be able to deal with the fact that, you know, once you follow someone, you, that lasts forever until you one day unfollow them again. So, if we wanted to uh, implement this in pseudocode, let's say um, we maintain some state uh, in this stream join. Uh, the state is for each user, we maintain the current list of followers of that user. And whenever we get an event that says that uh, A now follows B, we find the list of followers for user B, B and add user A to the set of followers for B. Um, we do the, un the reverse when A unfollows B, we simply find that set of followers and remove A from the set of followers. And then when we get a send tweet event, well then uh, when if A sends a particular tweet, we find all of the followers of A, uh, then we find the timeline for each of the followers, uh, for each of the followers, and we add the new tweet to the timeline, to the appropriate timeline. And so what this gives us is essentially a materialized view of this SQL query that we talked about earlier. So we have taken our input events uh, our facts, which are the, the sending tweet events, the follow and unfollow events. And from this, we have derived a materialized view, which is the home timeline for a particular user. And this has been an example of a uh, non-windowed join. So I was dis making this distinction between windowed and non-windowed. I think we've seen enough examples of the windowed systems. So I'm going to now drill down further on the non-windowed side of things. And so we've seen the Twitter home timelines is an example as one example of a materialized view, which required a non-windowed join. Um, we can also look at database replication, which also has quite similar characteristics to this. It might seem like a, I'm jumping around the topics quite wildly here, but you'll see that there are actually some quite common similar ideas here. Uh, so let's think about database replication as an event-based system. So there are different ways how you can implement replication. Um, you know, you can have gossip protocols, you can have anti-entropy and so on. Uh, what I'm going to focus on right now is log-based replication, which is perhaps the most common, where you have one designated uh, database node, which is the, the leader or the primary or the master. And whenever you want to write to the replicated system, you make your writes to this leader uh, node. And then the leader executes some kind of replication protocol by which uh, the other replicas, whom we might call those followers or backups, um, those other replicas also receive a copy of the data that was written to the leader. And 
the idea here being that um, any data that is written to the leader also gets written to all of the other replicas. And so at least after the replicas have caught up, then all of the replicas should be in the same state. They should contain the same data. And with log-based replication, the way this works is that the leader maintains a log. Uh, and every time that some data is written to the leader, an event or a record is appended to the end of this replication log. And this replication log just grows in an append-only way as events are added. And after an event has been written to the log, the log is immutable. Now, any follower that wants to have a copy of the data in the leader, it now reads this replication log sequentially. It simply starts from the beginning and processes it one event uh, at a time. And it reads those events in the log or those records and applies them to its own copy of the database. And as it does so one after a time, it will repeat exactly the same sequence of writes that were made on the leader. And when the follower has reached the end of the log, then we know that it will be in the same state as the leader. And so this is standard stuff and it works very well. And there are two key characteristics of a log that make this form of replication work. Firstly, the log is totally ordered, which means that you know, all, uh, all replicas see exactly the same sequence of log records and they see them in the same order. And secondly, it's append only. So we only append new events at the end of the log and thereafter they remain immutable and we don't go and back, go, go back and change past uh, chunks of the replication log. So each of these uh, entries in the log, we can think of as an event. And um, we might now ask, how do we actually construct one of these logs? Well, there are two ways how this can be done usually. One is that um, the people who set, the, set up the systems, the administrators of the database, designated one of the machines to be the leader. Um, and so they fix the configuration in such a way that, OK, this machine is the leader. The others are the secondaries or the followers. And if the leader uh, becomes unavailable, then the humans who set up the system manually reconfigure the system to use one of the other replicas as leader instead. Alternatively, you can use a consensus algorithm such as Paxos or Raft or any of the others, uh, which essentially does the same thing, but automatically with automatic election of leader and uh, automatic process for changing over to a new leader if the old leader dies. Um, but both of these are essentially just forms of constructing such a replication log. Now, there are two different ways how we can think about this replication log, and I want to distinguish those now. So the most common that uh, people are probably familiar with is what's called primary backup replication, which is exactly what I said just now. So when the user wants to write some data, they make a, a database transaction on the primary or on the leader. Uh, and in that database transaction, they can read and write the database in whatever way they like, and any mutations they make to the state of the database. So any changes they make, for example, inserting, updating, or deleting some rows, the database records any such changes that were made, which are, those changes are essentially a side effect of executing the transaction. And the database then records any of those changes in the replication log. This replication log could be a logical log, which means that it records the uh, which table had which rows inserted and deleted, or uh, it could be a physical log, which is literally in this block on disk, we replace this range of bytes with this new range of bytes. Um, both work, both are used in practice. Um, they have slightly different trade-offs, but both are examples of this primary backup replication where the replication log really is a side effect of the transactions that were executed on the primary. And the, the, the backups or the secondary uh, replicas they don't execute the transaction. All they do is apply the changes that were described in the replication log. But there's a different way we could also do replication, which swaps around those roles. So in primary backup replication, this mutation of the database is the primary data model. And any log, uh, any, any events in the log are a side effect of executing the transaction. We could also do state machine replication, or a similar concept is known as event sourcing, They're essentially different phrasings of the same idea, uh, in which we swap around those two roles and we say, when the user interacts with the system and when the user wants to write data to the system, they don't actually speak directly to a database replica. replica. Instead, they construct an event that describes the change they want to make and append that uh, event to a log. So the log is now actually the primary data model for writing to the system. 
Now all of the replicas now consume this log and they execute some deterministic logic on every event that appears in the log. And so now because every replica will see the same events in the same order because it's a log and they execute the same deterministic logic, then those events, uh, those replicas will move, each replica will move through the same sequence of states because of the deterministic logic. And so they will end up in the same state. Um, so we end up with the same effect that the replicas have the same data in them and you can read from those replicas as, as the read data model in the system. Um, but we have now swapped around the roles. And so this um, the log in state machine replication and the events in the log actually become the primary data model for how we write to the system. And the state of the replicas is actually derived from the event log in the way that kind of resembles state machine replica, uh, in the way that resembles um, a materialized view maintenance like we were talking about earlier. So why do we have those two different approaches to replication? Well, there's some very good reasons why you might want to use uh, state machine replication. So let's take as an example, a system where students can enroll in courses and cancel their enrollment again and so on. So typical university-based course management system. And so an event in the log in, in such a system might be something like student X canceled their enrollment in course Y for reason Z. That's it. So it's a very nice, compact, uh, descriptive, uh, des like description um, of what happened, the, of the event that occurred. Whereas if you look at the replication log that a primary backup system would produce as a result of the equivalent change, was, well, you might have a bunch of tables and so maybe one table contains the enrollments. And so the cancellation of the enrollment corresponds to deleting a row from the enrollments table. Maybe you have a separate reason to record the cancellation reasons. So we would add a row to that table. Maybe you also have, for example, the um, the number of available places as a denormalized field, as essentially a cache on the course table. And so then if a student and cancels their enrollment, that means you also have to increment the number of available places. So if you look at the log event in the top uh, section here, you can see that you can reconstruct from it the fact that it must have been a, an enroll, uh, a cancellation of an enrollment, but it's quite an indirect. There's a lot of irrelevant detail there about the current database schema um, and how it happens to be implemented. Whereas the log event in the state machine replication approach is actually a very nice beautiful, descriptive, self-contained uh, event that, um, that you know, is a lot easier to interpret as, as a human working with the system. So that is one, example, one, one reason why you might want to use state machine replication because these descriptive events are actually very nice to work with. Another reason why you might want to use state machine replication is that um, the fact that you have derived a replica state from the events in the log through some deterministic logic means now the, the log is not modified by consuming these events. The events are still there in the log. And so you can go come along and process the events again. So for example, if you decide that you want to change the logic that you use for interpreting uh, an event, and maybe for example, maybe pre previously, you didn't have this uh, available places field and you want to add the available places to field to the schema, you now have to populate this field somehow. And so this means now you have to actually go back and well, somehow you have to recompute uh, the value of that field. One way of doing that would be to just write your new uh, event interpretation logic, which, um, which does the updating of the number of available places or which fixes a bug that you previously had in the event updating logic. Uh, and now you scan through the whole log of events from beginning to end, process each uh, log event, write them to a new replica, and the result you've now got a new system that has been um, that has been processed through some new logic uh, without actually changing the underlying data. This is really cool. This is something you can't really do in the mutable state type databases where you know once you've made the change to the database, that's it. There's, there's no description of why you made that change. All you have is that you know so one row was updated from this value to that value, but it doesn't include any explanation of why that happened or how you might do it differently another time. So this means the state machine replication or event sourcing approach is very good if you need to explain how the system got into a certain state, which you might need for audit purposes or for debugging, for example. So here are the pros and cons uh, of state machine replication versus primary backup replication. As I said, um, 
a nice thing about events is they can be very nicely descriptive. And so if you're in a business, for example, uh, often events will correspond very well to an action that occurred on the business level. So this is some an event is something that can make sense to non-technical people as well. Uh, so people who don't care about the current database schema, but who do care about the business processes that these events are describing. Uh, as I, we talked about auditability and debugging, we talked about being able to have potentially several different views onto one underlying log by just processing the events in several different ways, and even the ability to change the event processing logic after the fact and reprocessing events using a new logic. Downsides of state machine replication, well, you've got this extra level of indirection. First, you have to write the event, and then you have to translate the event into the, the current view, the, the read optimized view onto those events. Uh, so that can be extra work uh, in some systems that might not be worth it. Subtlety happens if you want to be able to validate an event before appending it to the log. For example, if you, want, if you are selling seats in a theater, you want to ensure you don't sell the same seat in the theater twice to two different people. Um, so that requires before you write that seat before you write that seat booking event to the log, you have to actually check that the seat being booked is still available, and that requires an up-to-date view of what is the booking status of every seat, is it still available or not? So that can require a little bit of extra care. Uh, this whole idea of recording all of the events in an append-only log can be expensive if the rate at w the rate at which events are coming in is very high, um, and so. You know, if it's a very high volume system, it might not be reasonable to store all of the events forever and reprocess them on demand. Um, but in many systems, the event of the rate of events, to be honest, is just not that high. And so actually reprocessing them is, is entirely feasible. And one more point there that is important is that in some systems, you actually do need to delete data. For example, for GDPR purposes, a user can request for their data to be deleted under the right to be forgotten. And this means you really do have to delete their personal data. Um, how do you do this if you have an append-only log where an event is immutable after it has been written? Um, so this suggests that you do actually need some way of rewriting the log to remove any uh, user data that has to be deleted. Um, or maybe you do something like encrypt the user data in such a way that you can then forget the encryption key. And that way, then you can leave it in the log, but you just can't decrypt it anymore. Um, Another one thing I might mention in this context that if you're interested in blockchains or distributed ledgers, they are essentially the same thing as state machine replication if you think about it. So the chain of blocks is just the totally ordered uh, records, uh, the log events. And uh, okay, you might have a Byzantine consensus protocol around it and a bit more security stuff. But the basic principle of you know having some events in a log and executing those events in order to determine the current state uh, like in a blockchain that might, well, cryptocurrency that might be the current uh, value of every account, um, you know, that is essentially doing state machine replication as well. So both primary backup replication and state machine replication, I said, rely on this totally ordered log, uh, which means that every replica processes the events in exactly the same order. And that is, that is wonderful if, in, for purposes of getting the replicas into the same state. But it does incur a cost, and that cost is because everyone, all of the replicas have to agree on the order in which the events appear in the log, which, excuse me, means that uh, on every event you want to append to the log, you have to talk to the leader and wait for a response to the leader before you know at which position your event appears in the log, which means that if you're running this protocol over long distances, uh, where there's a substantial round trip time, it can get quite slow. Um, it gets even worse if you're talking about data that's on mobile devices. And so on mobile devices, uh, say you have a to-do list on your phone and you want to sync that with the to-do list on your laptop. And uh, you know this is, or it might be a calendar, or it might be notes, something like this. And you still want this app to work even if you don't have network connectivity right now. So even if your phone currently can't connect to the network because you're on a train going through a tunnel or because you're in a supermarket where you can't get any cellular data reception, or whatever reason, many reasons why you might want, you still want the software on your phone to work. You still want to be able to check your to-do list, to change items, to add new items to your to-do list. And so now if you are disconnected, there's no way we can use a totally ordered replication log between your phone and your laptop because any change that you want to make in the case of this replication log would require talking to a leader 
And that simply is not possible if your phone is disconnected from the network. So that raises the question now, if we do want this thing to work on mobile devices where the devices might be offline, what equivalent do we have to the totally ordered event log? So the totally, evented, uh, totally ordered event log will only work in the case where the users are online and able to connect to the leader. So the alternative that we have in the, if we want to support offline working is we use a partial order rather than a total order. Interestingly, there's a connection here to, to, to the cap theorem, if you thought about that. Um, so the totally ordered event log corresponds exactly to the consistent and partition tolerant category in the cap theorem sense, whereas the partial order corresponds to the highly available type systems in the cap theorem sense. And so the distinction between totally ordered and partially ordered is that, well, totally ordered is just a linear order, as you would expect. Partial order means you can have some kind of branching and then things can occur concurrently and then branches can merge together and you can have any number of branches potentially existing in parallel. And so the structure that you get here out, get out rather than log is essentially a directed acyclic graph or a DAG. Um, if you worked with git commit histories, for example, that's an example of a partial order uh, where you have a DAG of commits. Um, and because Git allows you to make commits offline, it has exactly this property that it's impossible to enforce a, a total order unless you do stuff like rebasing after the fact, of course. Now, I'm now going to focus on these partially ordered systems for a while, but I want to clear out of the way a point of confusion that might exist there, which is that even in a partially ordered system, it is possible to make a total order uh, so even though we're staying within this partially ordered category, let me explain what I mean because this is maybe a bit confusing. Let's say we have two replicas and we have uh, each replica has a set of events and we're going to give each event a timestamp. Um, this timestamp is not going to be from a physical clock, so it doesn't tell you like Tuesday at 4 p.m. It might just be a logical timestamp, which means it consists essentially of a counter together with the ID of the replica that generated a particular event. And so I'm now going to say that the event A uh, and event B were both generated by replica A. And so they were given logical timestamps one and two respectively, together with the ID of the replica that generated them, which is the capital A. Now let's say that the two replicas want to add new events to their set of events. And so replica A wants to add events C and D and replica B wants to add events X and Y. And in a partially ordered system, these uh, additions of events can happen without any coordination. So even if the replicas are unable to communicate with each other right now, because they're offline, they can still add new events to the set. They can generate these logical timestamps for their events. Um, but sometime later after the fact, network communication will occur because the network, can network becomes available again. And now these replicas have to merge together their events. And now this is where the total order comes in it is still possible to put all of these events in a total order because we can simply order the events by their timestamp. And I'm going to say the timestamp ordering here is we're first going to compare the counter parts. And so if we'll put the events with the smaller counter first and the events with the higher counter later. And then if we have several events with the same counter, then we're going to compare their replica IDs. Um, and that's going to give us a unique total order. And so here in this example, I put 3a before 3b because we're going to say a comes before b and then 3b comes before 4a because 3 is less than 4 and then 4a comes before 4b and so now both replicas agree on the total order in which the events should occur however this is even though it's a total order it's not a log because it's not append only because if you look at this from the point of view of replica b for example replica, replica b first had a b x y and then later it learns about the events C and D, and it can't just append these events at the end of its log, or at the end of its set of sequence of events, um, because then the replicas would not have the same order of events. So replica B has to insert the C and the, and the D earlier on in its sequence of events. And that's what it makes it not a log, because we have to go back and insert uh, er events somewhere retroactively in the middle of this totally ordered sequence. But nevertheless, even though it's not a log, we can still use it 
in similar kind of ways as we use state machine replication. So in state machine replication, as we said, we just process the events in the order in which they appear in the log. In this case, we're just going to process the events deterministically in their increasing timestamp order. Um, and we could still build up a materialized view onto this. We can still do all of the stuff we did earlier in, in state machine replication. And we will still, because the two replicas do eventually end up with the same sequence of events, if they process the events in the same order, they will still end up in the same derived state from this. We just have to deal with the fact that events now might arrive out of order. And so therefore we have to do this insertion of event somewhere into the middle of this event sequence. So let's take for example, that we've got the state uh, A, B, C, X, D, Y, and then a new event K comes in and the new event has a timestamp of three C. So that means we have to put it between the event X and the event D. That's where it's going to have to slot in in this sequence of events. And so um, what we would need to do now here is to first of all, roll back the state and go back to the point in time after we've just applied ABX, uh, ABCX, but before we've applied DY. So this requires some way of jumping back to an earlier state of the database. We could probably do that with keeping some regular snapshots, for example, and then jumping back to the most recent snapshot before the insertion point and then replaying the events from that point onwards, something along those lines. So now we've got a prefix of our sequence of events. We put the new event K in the place where it belongs according to the timestamp ordering. We process that event K and then we replay any events that we previously undid and put those after the newly inserted event K. And so by doing this revert and then processing the event and then replaying the events forward again, we get essentially the same effect as if we had been doing state machine replication, but we get it without actually having a log, without having this event only property, uh, this append only property. And this technique is called time warp. Uh, it was written uh, up a long time ago already. And uh, it was developed, I think, for, for simulation systems, but you could use it in any sort of data systems, really. And time warp has some of the advantages of state machine replication. So it has the state machine replication like mapping of events to state, and you can use arbitrary logic as long as it's deterministic um, to do that mapping from events to state. But the advantage of a state machine replication is that the replicas can still read and write their state while they're offline. Um, because we don't require this agreement on the order of the events as they are appended to the log. The downside of time warp is, well, you have to do this rollback and replay, which can be expensive if you have to insert uh, a new event somewhere far back in, in the event log history. Um, and this whole idea of reverting back to an earlier state works fine as long as the state is encapsulated within our system. Uh, it gets more difficult if we can have external side effects on other parts of the world. Uh, and in those cases, like for example, if you send an email um, as a side effect of processing an event, and then later you realize that actually that event you processed is no longer valid because you had to insert a new event ahead of it. Well, you can't unsend the email. I guess you could send a follow-up email saying that, uh, sorry, we got that wrong. It's now, the state is now something different. Um, but you know, if you really can't afford this kind of uh, apologies, then you can't use time warp. You have to use uh, state machine replication instead and you have to um, accept a cost that it won't work offline. So that's the distinction between uh, total order and partial order that we talked about. And I want to now sort of break this in a sort of two by two matrix and say, we talked about time warp as this example of a system where the event generation is partially ordered, even though then we do afterwards put the events in the total order by timestamp, but the events structure themselves is partially ordered. And time warp is what we get if we have this data model of immutable events where we process the event through some deterministic logic to get the current database state. If we do the same thing with the immutable events, uh, but use a totally lo ordered log as input instead, well, we get state machine replication as we talked about. On the other hand, we could change the data model and instead of appending events to a log, we could say our data model is um, to, uh, is to write, do a transaction on the primary and then to write the side effects of that transaction uh, to the replication log, that's primary backup replication. And so in that case, we're treating the application's data model that we're working with is this mutable state where the database state can be mutated by the application. 
So this raises the question now, what do we get if we take the partial ordering from time warp and the mutable state approach to the data model uh, from primary backup replication? And the answer is we get something called conflict-free replicated data types, or CRDTs. And I want to talk that, about that in my last few minutes. So CRDTs are really good in this sort of system where you've got replicas that need to be able to update their state while they're offline and then resynchronize sometime later. So building again on the to-do list example, we have, um, let's say we, ha we have a to-do list synced between phone and laptop and we might represent the to-do list as a, a JSON-like data structure, something like this. And uh, so we can have each item on the to-do list as, as a record in a list um, where each, each one now has um, the, a title, which is by milk, for example, or watering the plants. And the uh, done field corresponds to, the uh, done field is a Boolean that corresponds to the checkbox on whether a particular item has been done or not. And so now we can update the state of this. We can mutate the state of this database. And for example, by checking the checkbox on watering the plants, we're setting this done field from false to true. And maybe a different user wants to add a new item to, do, to the to-do list, say we need to do the laundry, uh, and adds this as an item to, uh, to this list of to-do items. And you can imagine those things happening concurrently, of course, because the devices might be offline. Um, maybe if you've got uh, a to-do list synced between you and your partner, maybe you make a change on your device while it's offline concurrently, your partner makes a change on their device, and then you have to merge those two together. And in this example here of the to-do list, there's a reasonably logical resolution of uh, how to do that merge we just keep the done true on the watering the plants and we keep the insertion of doing the laundry. And what CRDTs are is essentially a set of algorithms that performs exactly this conflict resolution and this kind of merging for different types of data. So it's a way of describing mutable data in such a way that we record exactly what changes are being made as a side effect of the user interacting with the application in some way or another and we can package up the, those, um, those mutations that the user made as events or operations, they're called in the CRDT literature. And we can propagate those uh, operations or events from one device to another. And we then have a way of updating the other device's state in such a way that everyone ends up with the same state at the end and the changes that were made by different users concurrently are merged together cleanly. So this is what CRDTs give us it's, um, it's a way of managing data that does work offline, like Time Warp. It's a, a partially ordered system. It allows different replicas to make progress um, independently from each other, even if there's no communication possible right now. Um, on the other hand, differently from Time Warp, it does not require this rollback and replay uh, structure normally because uh, CRTTs are designed to have operations that are commutative. So the operations carry some extra metadata and making them commutative means you can apply the operations of the events in a different order on each replica and still end up with the same state at the end. And so this now allows us, this means we don't have to flatten the total order, uh, the, the partial order into a total order. We don't have to do the rollback and replay. We can just apply the events as they occur to the state and the CRDT algorithm ensures that we nevertheless converge to the same state on all of the replicas. Uh, so CRDTs are particularly good uh, model, particularly good approach for those applications that have this kind of state mutation-like data model. So if you're thinking about a text editor, for example, text editor is all about state mutation because you've, you've got a state, which is the current text document, and you can mutate that state by typing letters, that is inserting or deleting characters at any point in, in the document. And so um, this state mutation fits very well to CRDTs if as a way of um, generating those events then which describe those edits to, to the text document. And the nice thing about CRDTs is that they are like ready-made packaged algorithms where the application doesn't need to provide any conflict resolution logic normally um, because the CRDT itself handles these things. And so, for example, if you have several users inserting new to-do list items at the same position in the to-do list, then the CRDT will ensure that nevertheless, everyone ends up with the same uh, sequence of to-do list items on their screen, so the same items in the same order. A downside of CRDT is that um, there are certain predefined data types that you can use, like you know lists and maps and structures like that. 
you can't very easily make your own uh, data types. It's, it's a fair bit of work to, to design your own CRDTs. Um, and the types of operations that you can do are also predefined. So for example, there are many data types for ordered sequences like lists, but not many of them allow you to reorder the items in a sequence. So that's uh, something that can be added, but it's um, not very easily done by applications. And finally, the term conflict-free people sometimes debate about a bit because uh, in the end, essence, you know, you can have built-in conflict resolution policies, which mean that most uh, conflicts due to concurrent updates are resolved automatically, but it's not entirely conflict-free really in, in the strict sense. So to zoom out and recap, we started with talking about the, the, the landscape of event-based systems by first of all asking, are we talking about notifications here? Are we talking about persistent records of things that happened or even both of them? We then broke down the persistent notifications uh, channel of this further, looked at windowing and non-windowing. Windowing gives us sort of stream analytics and CEP style things. Non-windowing takes us in the direction of materialized views and database replication. And then finally for database replication and materialized views, we did this two by two square comparing both the data model that you can use and the ordering guarantee that the underlying system produces. And that is the taxonomy that I wanted to talk about. So I hope that you found that useful way of just thinking about all the different things you can do with events. It's by no means ex exhaustive and it's somewhat subjective to my personal view, um, but maybe it's something you will find useful as well. There is a paper that accompanies this talk which uh, includes a whole bunch of extra material that unfortunately I don't have time to talk about uh, right now. Um, so there's some case studies based on systems that I've worked on personally, including uh, the Apache Kafka ecosystem for stream processing and local first collaboration software. And finally, some ideas on future research ideas uh, on uh, event-based systems. So I hope you can check out the paper as well, uh, which is at the URL here on the slide. And feel free to contact me with any questions for those of you at the conference. I'm, of course, available for any questions now as well. Thank you very much for listening.